We know that in the last 30 years, the world's become much more polarized. There's more hate, there's more anger, there's more mental health problems, right? So if you look at it directly correlates, everyone says mental health has gone terrible in the last 20 years, right? And what's crazy is this, what's been in the last 20 years, right? There's been a lot more social media with a lot more bullying. And as a kid, you could run away from bullies. Nobody knew where you were, yeah. but now they can follow you, right? But if you look at another way, we've allowed it to happen because in those companies, that's where the money is, is if you polarize people enough, they're coming back for that content. So they're not actually wanting general content because somebody who's already, you know, you always want to be, it's like the same model, I suppose, in the old days for religions as well, right? So you preach to your converted, you're more likely to get more business. This episode of A Beacon of Hope is proudly brought to you by Campfire Studios. To find out more, visit campfirestudios.co.nz. Two, three, four. A Beacon of Hope is a weekly podcast that shines a light on the human spirit and explores the power of hope in our lives. Join me, Will Fleming, as I talk to people from all walks of life about where they find hope and how they use it to navigate life's challenges. Be good. Be safe. And be happy. Dr. Sherard Paul is a renowned author and skin doctor who weaves together skin, science, and nature to help us create meaning in life. Sherard has been very kind to me over the years, always saying yes to coming on my podcasts. So I look forward to sharing with you today as Sherard shares a bit about his story and how he sees the world as it relates to hope. Sherrod, how can I introduce you, Dr. Sherrod Paul? As you like. Huh? Yeah, my friend. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've never agreed to be my <laughs> friend, but you keep answering my emails. Maybe we start there. Sherrod, um, you've always said yes when I ask you to come on a podcast. I'm not sure why. Like, we just talked a bit off, off camera, off microphone, that because of podcasting, you get to know people. And maybe what I really like about getting to know you is I feel like I get a sense of, you know, the person outside of the surgery and all of that stuff, just as someone who gives a damn about life. And today I wanted to invite you here just to see if we can unpack why. You know, like there's many people out there who contact me and and who you see and, you know, media and stories that seem to have given up on life. And that's really sad. It's something I don't identify with. And I don't know why I'm like that. I think it's a mixture of family, you know, um, love, but I can understand that some people don't have that, so it makes sense that they fall out of love with life. But you're someone who seems to love life. I mean, that's true, right? Yeah, I think the most important thing is to, like I've said this in my books and in other interviews and things, I think the most important thing to understand is whatever your beliefs, right? So if you're, say, Western, um, like in in a sense that you're Judeo Christian, mm. Anglo Saxon kind of thing, then you believe in heaven or hell, right? For religious, or if you're Eastern, mostly Eastern religions, Hindu, Buddhist, they believe in reincarnation. If you're greeny atheist and you think you're just going to be recycled by earthworms, right? But irrespective of the commonality in all this, is we are never going to come back in this form, right? So you're never going to be like this and I'm never going to be like this. Whatever you believe out of these three possibilities, it doesn't matter. This is your only chance to make a difference. So I, as you know, in my medical work, you know, I deal with skin cancer and you de- you've you dealt with people at the end of life. Mm-hmm. I have never at the end of life, you know, met somebody who said, look, I should have bought my fifth car or I should have had my third <laughs> Mistress, what you know what I mean? Like mm. fundamentally, what matters at that time is the people who really love them and the people they mm. really love and the connections they make. So actually, uh, I literally never say no to people unless I fundamentally have no affinity with them or dislike them. So in that way, I'm often... Uh, you know, not a good businessman in the sense because I've seen people really network just for 
um, pur- purpose of advancing themselves, right? It, it's never been me. Like I always have to have a connection. And if I think you are doing something good mm. or your intentions are good, I always say yes. So. But isn't it, it seems to be weird though, because if you look on maybe I'll just generalize social media, or if you ask people who don't have much, what would an awesome life be? It would be the third car. It would be option. Maybe options is what they, th- they're putting it down to money or wealth, but it's having options, you know, and maybe there's something that needs to be unpacked there, right? Yeah, I think certainly having enough money to live on mm. um, gives you more options compared to when you have no money, right? But on the other hand, I've met many billionaires over my lifetime and all the work I do internationally, but they're not actually any happier, right? Mm. Uh, so I think the key thing is just having enough that you can, you know, that you don't have to worry about putting food on the table or, you know, those kind of stuff. And that's why it's important even in everything to have a plan as to how you're going to get there. Because like I've often said, sometimes it's just a lack of confidence. So I remember I was at, I do some work as you know, with children in schools and we, um, you know, it's mostly teaching them creative writing, but as part of it, you're talking to them about possibilities in their life because in a lot of uh, poor schools it's not real for the children to be uh, you know a doctor or a lawyer or something like that and the key thing is to say you know you can become anything and I remember the school and this uh, Pacific Island kid said asked what did you want to become and he said I want to become a barrister and so I said look so you're going to be the best barrister in the world right and he said oh I think I'll just be okay and I said look if you think you'll only be okay only your mom will hire you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reality in life is mm. teaching people self-belief is an important part. So everyone's got enormous potential. So if you look around the world, there have been lots of people who've achieved huge things who've had much worse backgrounds than what we think is bad in New Zealand, for example, right? Mm. Because in New Zealand, if you take somebody who thinks they're in the poverty line in New Zealand, but then you translate it across to parts of Asia or Africa, they'll think this is rich, right? True. Um, so, so I think it's largely a mindset thing. Of course, I'm not, uh, you know, belittling or thinking less or, uh, or anyone who doesn't have enough. But what I mean is largely if you get out of the thinking, mm. you can turn it around. Mm. There the are opportunities everywhere. Um, why do you think you think like that? I'm sure you know lots of people who, and I know lots of people who don't think about that stuff, who just focus on, you know, like you said, it's the it's the accolades, it's the pursuit of these other goals. You know, I, I what was it about either your upbringing or your story that makes you want to pass on that hope to others? I don't know why I have it either. Why am I sitting here having a podcast about hope? I should just be getting on with life. But my big hope is that when you talk on these cameras, that someone can see the clip and then that can be a positive influence versus the negative stuff, the algorithm. I know I've just asked you a question, but I saw an AI. Do you know Di Henwood, the comedian? Yeah, yeah. This morning I saw an AI ad of him selling something else that wasn't him. And I was so shocked because his hands were moving like die, the mouth was a bit off, but he was selling some keto diet pill. and But he wasn't, it was AI. And I was just like, that's what we're contending with. A whole series of robots being programmed to tell our brain to do something else. Uh, yeah, so just going back, like, why, why do you care about human AI? Yeah, I think one of the things, it's funny, because I was at uh, some event where, there are lots of people with, who were discussing AI and actually there are lots of people who are very bullish about it, mm. right? And they actually think literally very soon was a quote I heard that everything um, you see on the internet won't be um, real soon, <laughs> right? Absolutely. But, but people see that as a great thing. I don't because I actually think that it may be for another um, species beyond us. So 
see, human beings all came out of Africa about 100,000 years ago. So if you look in the fullness of Earth, you know, Earth's been around you know, near almost 5 billion years, right? So we've been like a minuscule time stamp in it. But we evolved organically. So our skin colors, our heights and body shapes and everything corresponded to how we uh, migrated and the diets we ate and the lifestyles. But now we've become quite homogenous, right? So we generally, in most countries, you will get the same kind of foods and the various things. So we don't see those big changes between us. But on the other hand, what we're tinkering with is literally what made us what we are. So the fundamental thing with us is we are storytellers, right? That's the difference. See, so, yeah, um, because I'm kind of an international skin expert, I operate on humans and sometimes called to operate on animals. Right? Now, you see, in a human being, I can tell you a story. I can say, well, look, if I come on this podcast, I'm going to give you this, this, and you're going to believe it, right? If I say I'm going to give it to you next year, right? But if I'm operating an orangutan and I said, look, if you do this, I'll give you a banana next year. <laughs> it's not going to <laughs> cooperate. So because they don't believe stories, animals have more intuition. We mm. don't have intuition about what's good for us, mm. right? So, so we can drink something which is terrible for us, like Coke or something, and think, hey, it tastes good. But a small example, I, I was saying artificial sweetness can cause diabetes the same because our minds don't know the difference between artificial and real sweetness. People don't realize it. But our fundamental difference in all this is that we are storytellers. So then you go back to what is it that is crafting a story about? And that's what I teach children. And that comes to literally a parable for life and the story writing. If you want to write a story, there are three things. So first you set the context, right? And that may be even the story of your podcast. So you've mm. got to say, what is this podcast about? You may ask the same thing about your life. You may say, what is my life about? What does Will's life going to be, right? If I wrote my story at the end of it. And the second thing is um, you develop the characters like in a story. And in a personal sense, you develop your own characters. So some of it requires a bit of mind training, sacrifices. You can't just be get everything you want and think that's fair. So you've got to understand that Life isn't fair, but we can still succeed, right? I've had a lot of failure setbacks where I've migrated countries, often like a place like New Zealand, isn't very necessarily friendly. You know what I mean? Like what I mean is whether we like it or not, New Zealand's quite um, racist in Absolutely. a way. Absolutely. Right? We, we don't like saying it. If you say it, people immediately take umbrage. But the reality is that's a fact. If you travel overseas, US or somewhere, it's funny, it's less because they're so, we think it's worse. But in actual fact... They actually don't care where you're from as long as you're <laughs> successful. Absolutely. Right? So I, I run some skincare companies and we do some trade in the US. I was just there recently and people were like, I was asking them for bank accounts because we don't even have checks in New Zealand and America. They still write checks, right? Mm. But they were like, oh, we didn't realize you're not from here. But, you know, here I've been here like, you know, 31 years as even in finals of the New Zealand of the year once, people will still say, but you're not from here, you know, where yeah. are you from? So we have that kind of a thing. So, so weird. So the second thing is you develop your own character mm. or in the stories you write, you develop the character. So if you're in this office, you're all working together. And lastly, you resolve conflicts. There's always going to be conflicts between your plan and what's happening, but you resolve it by understanding, okay, what's the reason for it? How do I go forward? Mm. So I think... That would be my simple message. So the problem with AI is it's just purely looking at commercialism without uh, this aspect. So what we're saying is we're giving up the stories, um, writing to AI in a just pure reason for it. Why is it more efficient? Because it can commercialize it faster. Yeah. So the problem with that is fundamentally what made our brains grow, what made us like that is going. Mm. So my concern is where this will lead to is with everyone, like every time I travel to Silicon Valley, I think people are much more into real artificial intelligence, like almost implanting chips in your brain and the whole kind of bionic thing. But that's not for us. So what I think is eventually, if we're not careful, we'll just be a footnote and there'll be another semi-human bionic species, right? Absolutely. And, and the concern I have is like, we've only been around 100,000 years out of Africa. 
the Neanderthals lived for 500,000 years. At the rate we're going, that's one thing I'm not that hopeful about is that <laughs> I don't think we we'll last even that long. Yeah. But as an individual life, you know, I have a great hope. Man, it's it's wild because take me, I, I think I was dyslexic growing up, which makes total sense that I now do this for a job. I had to rely on trying to read the people around me physically, not actually reading text. You know, I just, it wasn't making sense. And so I hate writing and I can actually say I hate writing. I've made peace with it and sometimes I do it and sometimes people give me good feedback, but it's not a nice feeling. I don't get positive dopamine. I have to really grunt through. But weirdly, since AI comes in and Guy producing here, he growls me every time I send him something with AI because Guy's a writer, you know, he writes films and whatnot. And he's like, oh, great, chat GPT did well today. But what I've realized is, my inadequacies are becoming strengths because people must be able to tell that it's written by a human, not telling it consciously, maybe subconsciously, maybe seeing that I don't have the perfect emoji on every line, seeing that the sentence structure is a bit wonky. I wonder if that's going to hold any weight. But listening to you talk, Sherrod, it might be that I'm a Neanderthal. Yeah. And um, <laughs> no, I think one of the things with things like ChatGPT and things are – they're great as if you're using it as an assistant as opposed to, so, so I use it in my research a bit in the sense that if, because I work largely for myself and kept myself independent, so even my university positions are adjunct because that way I can just do my own thing. Mm. Um, you don't have a lot of interns and things, right? So if you are now doing a large volume of work and if you want certain things summarized and then you can then go and uh, so if you want to say get me 10 articles which were written on it but only search these journals right and you're giving it very specific directions mm. it's a great um, research assistant and then you do the work the real work right so I think you know that way it's great potential even if people were dyslexic or whatever because helps them mm. you know, frame things but I think the problem is everyone's going the other extreme where we are not even asking what is it meant to be human, right? So everywhere I go in the US, uh, everyone's more about longevity for the sake of longevity. In other words, lifespan, how long can we live, right? I personally think, look, you got to live well when you're here. And I'm more about, I suppose, health span so that mm -hmm. while you're alive, you're able to do whatever you want and be totally fit and well. But I think... Um, so I think I've lived in that way, in the positive way. And so, you know, it helps what most people think, oh, you can't be 57, you know, that kind of stuff, mm. right? But on the other hand, I think what it means is that um, if you're just striving just for those numbers, you're never going to be in your prime beyond, say, 120, because the reality is it's not possible for our species. You know, mm -hmm. there is a finite limit because we evolved organically. Absolutely. Do you follow that guy, Brian, somebody? He's trying to reduce his – do you know him, Guy? Brian Johnson. Have you come across that no, person? I haven't, no. So he's a uh, tech billionaire yeah. who's now doing everything to kind of de-age. Might be worth checking out. He is a real interesting person because he measures everything. He's he Actually, when you watch his content, it's a bit – overwhelming because you realize what you're not doing yourself and that's what we were saying off here like there's actually a hundred checklist things you have to do in a day especially if you have you know a partner or a family and and it can feel like man what's the right stuff to do because i'm, I'm always scared Sherrod, that you you're obviously doing things unintentionally like uh having a coke zero thinking you're doing a bit better yeah. but you, you probably know you're not, yeah. but at the same time, your brain still is, you know, registering it as this and it's putting you on that other path. And yeah, I mean, for you knowing a lot about people and humans and how we kind of work, is that a good thing? Is it frustrating? Do you kind of think sometimes you'd rather not know because, you know, if you meet me, you might see seven warning signs and you're like, oh, well, I guess I'm not going to tell Will that today yeah. because really – you're telling people things that are wrong with them and humans don't want to agree with that, you know? Yeah, and I think that's what I do from a educational point of view. So my previous book, which 
has done quite well. It's called the genetics of health. Mm -hmm. And it's basically about eating and drinking, exercising for your gene type. And I actually run a gene testing program for wellness. Mm -hmm. Most people run it for illness, right? And for uh, specifically diagnosing, say, cancers or this or that. But ours is all about wellness. It's just about what you eat and drink. But I guess the other thing, when you were talking about this other gentleman and uh, living to, a, um, you know, anti-aging or super-aging is, one thing you got to understand is super-agers, like people who can keep their youth for longer, it is not that they don't get the stuff um, others get, they just get them later. Mm -hmm. So that's the fundamental thing we don't understand. Because we're an organic being, you can't eliminate it. So as we get older, our genes... Uh, you know, there's more errors and replication, so more tumors and things develop, right? But what happens is, so if you see somebody who has trained themselves or lived a life that they can become a super ager, then they'll probably still get it at 100, but they're probably not going to get it at 80, right? So I think that's where the potential is, and that's something I write about in the Genetics of Health, and I've got another book. Mm -hmm. will be coming on a few months called Biohack Your Genes, exactly really? on the same topic. Yeah. But actually, uh, right off my website, you'll be able to find the, the metagenomics. It's like a gene testing program, and anybody can order it. But the reality is, it's all about just being empowered. But what you raise is a very valid point. The other thing is, we're not intuitive, and our industries are all not about empowering you, but <laughs> treating you, right? That's right. So so what I mean is there is much more money in illness than in wellness. Mm. And you spend majority of your, I think there's something like 80% of your healthcare costs are in your last year of your Zero, life, right. right? So, but having said that, like what I find is people are less reluctant to do, say my gene test, which may be 500 bucks, I think even though that gives you a, blueprint for how you can mm. but the moment something goes wrong and you just need to have one test or one procedure you've blown that budget <laughs> anyway right but it is because we are not intuitive so i'll just give this minor example like take caffeine for example right 50 percent of the population are fast metabolizer of caffeine 50 percent are slow so if you're a fast metabolizer it's actually really good for you so in other words helps you with, you know, not only alertness, it can, uh, sports performance, various things. But if you are a slow metabolizer, it can actually cause irregular heartbeats and things like that, and you may end up on medications because mm -hmm. of it. But it's not intuitive, because if I have a coffee, say, after 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I can't sleep, get a little bit of palpitation. So I thought, I'm surely I must be a slow metabolizer. But when I tested it, I was fine. But my daughter, she was a slow wow. metabolizer, right? So then... So she avoids um, caffeine. But the reality is, so there's lots of things like that. And to answer your question, like Coke and things, see, the industry, they're very clever at these things. So I was actually speaking about it at another event where what astounded me is how much science goes into even hooking you on something. Mm. So if you look at um, Coke, so we know that sugar and salt, for example, are addictive in the sense if you expose a child very early, to salty foods or sugary foods, they get addicted for life. Yep. So you've got a customer for life. So that's why fast foods which is, or processed things which are more sugary or more salty are typically targeted at children, right? You make games for them, playgrounds mm. and things like that because mm. once they're hooked on it, they're going to have a taste for it for the rest of their Absolutely. life, right? But on the other hand, what I found interesting is if you take drinks like Coke and all that, we know that caffeine dulls the um, sweet taste receptors. So if you remove the uh, caffeine out of it, you'd actually find them too sweet to drink that you wouldn't be able to drink. That's so why would you need to make it so sweet? Because if you don't make it so sweet, you won't get addicted to it. So so a lot <laughs> of these illegal. drinks, so, Seems so what I mean is a lot of these other drinks which are caffeinated, actually much more sugary than they really are. So it's actually, there's a science behind mm. how does somebody, and even even like I was talking to somebody about, even if you look at video games, right? There was a th evidence that, or there was a study somewhere which I saw that for the developers, they actually had tests on people where they were looking at, is their heart rate going up enough? Are they hitting that kind of, I mean, are they getting enough of a, uh, 
buzz out of it. And if it didn't hit that, doesn't matter if the game is very good. They're like, nah, you go back, you got to develop it because you need to have it so that people keep coming back for more, right? And I guess the thinking is, what do we do about that? You know, is it, I I mean, I've tried to give myself general rules that if you have good relationships, there will be things happening automatically. Like us catching up is not just for content. It's interaction with another human. It's checking yourself to make sure that we're playing the game of life, you know? That's right. Texting each other. Yeah. Constant negotiation. But also, like, uh, the bit that I've added on to that now is trying to have your own life and your destiny. And I don't think I'm at the point where, like, when you talk about genetic testing, I'm nearly saying to you, okay, I'll come see you when I don't just need something cut off me. Yeah, yeah. You know, where it'll be an investment. But I've had these conversations with lots of friends. When it gets to that realm of investing in yourself, you also feel vulnerable because you feel like you might get like a a bad Tony Robbins or... But that's why I don't test for illness at all. Mm. So that's why philosophically, because I think if you test for illness and you find something, it's going to screw you up in the stress response. So I actually don't test for any illnesses. It's mm. just for wellness. So mm. what c- can you do to optimize your performance? Yeah. But but on, on the same topic, you see, one of the problems with the reason all these industries, like you were saying, are, shouldn't be legal in a way, but they are, is because the model is one of relentless growth, right? Enough is never enough. And I think that's where the problem is. So that's the same with the algorithms, right? So whether it's um, Facebook, Instagram, we know that in the last 30 years, the world's become much more polarized. There's more hate, there's more anger, there's more mental health problems, right? So if you look at it directly correlates, everyone says mental health has gone terrible in the last 20 years, right? And what's crazy is this, what's been in the last 20 years, right? There's been a lot more social media with a lot more bullying. And as a kid, you could run away from bullies. Nobody knew where you were, yeah. but now they can follow you, right? But if you look at another way, We've allowed it to happen because in those companies, that's where the money is, is if you polarize people enough, they're coming back for that content. So they're not actually wanting general content because somebody who's already, you know, you always want to be, it's like the same model, I suppose, in the old days for religions as well, right? So you preach to your converted, you're more likely to get more business (laughs) than if you, so that model of relentless growth, I think is bad because I think at some point you got to say, look, I want to now look after the people who are my uh, customers or clients. Mm. But the thing is, it's just more and more and more. So that's a model in the ultra, you know, capitalistic kind of a model. And I guess that doesn't translate well to health. So that's why you look, if you look at health, the most expensive spend in health would be in countries like the US. But there's a lot of ill health there as well. Mm. But then when you look at it and suddenly you have a pandemic and what happens is everyone only has access to the same vaccine, the same thing. So suddenly it's the total opposite of a capitalistic model, even though perhaps those companies are making them, but realistically there's no other treatment options or there's no other, everyone's only got the same vaccine, right? Mm. It's not like you can pay and get a better one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think, yeah. So I think that there needs to be a balance, but like I said, I've never met anyone even at that extreme who's any happier than just when you have enough. Yeah, and that's the, at least in life, it's fair when it comes to death because that's something you can try and run away from, but it's going to find you. And currently, you know, until I guess you can upload yourself to a thing and then that thing can, can be classed as a person and then you're immortal, which I'm sure people have, really rich people have been trying. Well, people are very much off their viewpoint. That's what I'm saying. I don't like that because I think our race is different. That may be a totally different thing. Hmm. And so when you frame this up, I guess my question to you is, I think it feels like it's maybe weighted against us that, you know, I was one of those kids that when my mum came from the Pacific, she thought she was doing me a favor by letting me have McDonald's because she never had that. She got teased for the opposite reason, which was – you're genetically skinny. And that meant you didn't have enough money to afford food, which was kind of partly the case. And so I don't think she was just tricked by media and marketing. She was actually thinking she was doing her son a favor. And we've laughed about it, you know, over the years. And she said, oh, sorry, I thought I was, you know, hooking you up. 
I said, no, nah, it's uh, something I've now got to work out. Um, and, and I'm currently aware that I'm on a trajectory of, you know, age. And so maybe part of these conversations is, is self-serving. But in asking you, we know it's slightly weighted against us. There must be mega money to make in all facets of this game. You know, giving people stink food, giving them the pill to fix their symptoms, etc. Why, why, um, why care from your side? You said before about maybe not being the best business person because you know you make decisions based on ethics and yeah. your feelings. Not just the best. I'm terrible at it, <laughs> but <laughs> but but you know that will make you awesome in people's memories. You know that you gave a crap about them, but I think it's also as much about you as well. Like I think mm. that's what the um, secret is. Like what I found is, in a funny sort of way, when I've met a lot of billionaires, I've actually, funnily enough, felt sadness for them in in a way that I'm a very much a people person, so intuitive. Because what I was thinking is, look, if I lost everything, right, I still have a lot of people who think. I'm worth interacting with, yeah. right? But I could see that every connection they had was literally based on their money or their business or their ability to pay. Even their interactions with, say, charities were because they had the money to give now, right? Mm. If they didn't have that, they had no identity. No one suddenly thought, actually, you're a really nice guy. I'd like to spend some time with you because they think you're a terrible guy, but... I need you for a purpose. Mm. So I think from it's more about you yourself have to think then that that's why they don't necessarily doesn't necessarily translate to good health and the whole thing is organic. So I I think it's your stress response as well, right? So in an acute kind of a situation stress is good. That's why you know going to the gym or doing some physical activity it stresses your body but in the short term. Mm. But if it's chronic, like if you're overtraining or overthinking about stuff, then you get cortisol and all that secreted, con- that suppresses your immune system. So you're actually more likely to fall ill and things like that. Mm. So I think it's all interlinked, like the mind and body. And to the point that, you know, from my skin thing, I can tell you that we have studies where if you are a negative person outlook, like you don't have hope, but you're like very negative you are much more likely to heal slower than somebody who is positive, right? And actually, there's a recent study on this topic which is quite interesting is um, when people looked at also how you perceive stress. So, So just now I was telling you about actually you having stress. But the second thing is the brain is so powerful in how that's why this mind training about how you can be hopeful is important is because they looked at people who in the US was a large study and they looked at three groups and they looked at people with, do you, have you had a lot of stress? Have you had moderate stress or how you think you've got no stress? And then they looked at the people who felt they had a lot of stress. So within that group, they then took and they asked the question saying, do you think the stress is going to affect your health? Right. And so the people who thought that the stress was going to affect the health were 40% more likely to die of all causes, like not just disease, illness, accident, whatever. Mm. So what it means is the people who actually thought, yeah, yeah, I'm stressful, but they could understand it. They could rationalize it. They're like, yeah, but that's because I'm doing all this kind of stuff. Nothing's going to happen to me. I'm fine, <laughs> right? They actually, therefore, were 40% less likely to actually, this was all cause mortality you're looking at, right? Mm. So so it's a mind is a very powerful thing. So I think that's why all of us, before we have any money or before we we had our minds, and that's why I think this topic is important because it's how you train your mind and you have hope and positivity with mm. a purpose. And I guess that's the bit that I'm stuck on is that it's easier to have hope when you were raised with that subconsciously you know I ha- even though my mum gave me too much mcdonald's she loved me to make up for it you know so did my dad there wasn't too many um high stress responses as a child in fact i probably could have had a bit more that would have helped me um but you know 
that's that thing to get your head around that you're talking about real things. And what I mean by that is it's a little bit that conversation on karma, you know, that there will be positive benefits if you conduct yourself properly. And you just hope that to be the case, to be true on the other side, that people who are out there doing negative things on purpose, it doesn't feel like they get their payback. Oh, yeah, I I don't think, (laughs) I actually don't think that. So I actually don't believe in karma on that way Mm. within our thing. And I don't believe in, I believe you make your own luck is what I would say, right? So, and I think the, what you said is actually a valid point. I've thought about it when I was younger, but because you see some of the worst human beings I've met in life, like <laughs> even in medicine and elsewhere, right? They're actually seem to be doing fine. But the reality is that the point of difference must be in your thinking. If you actually even wasting seconds thinking about them, then that's negative for you because that's a negative thought. So actually that's what I do like industry like medicine and that kind of guild-like ones like in New Zealand, they're actually very um, stressful, but also the way people compete can be negative. Like people may say things about you and you don't even know why. Like, you know, you've never said anything just because they think you're busy or whatever. Mm. But what I think is, so I never actually ever worry about what others are doing. So I have no idea how busy somebody else is. So you chart your same path. And I think that would be how you get around it is because you're not wasting any negative energy on worrying about what somebody did to other people and how he's still successful. That's not your problem. Yeah. That's his or her problem. And that will happen, may happen, may not happen, but it's still not your problem. True. You, your problem is you go on a positive path and good things will keep happening. Yeah. It's like almost like you can manifest your own uh, destiny, right? So. Oh, it feels true. You know, I'm not, I don't have enough courage to say it is true, but I know that from us taking our own pathway forward, it has only been positive so far. I'm sure the harder days are coming, but but maybe not if you conduct yourself correctly and if you don't overpromise and if you, you know. And I think there's also a training element. So a good small tip, like, you know, in as an educator and I mean, professor roles and other things, you know, in student thing, we talk about grade point averages and GPA kind of stuff, right? But when we're talking about hope, hope I view as like almost like optimism with a plan, right? So rather than being just blindly positive, which is hopeless, it's just no point just saying, yes, my day is going to be fine. You know, that's like almost like a evangelical way of saying it, but it's not going to work because you've got to do something. So I think then there are three things within it. The GPA, I would say, is be your goals, then your plan of action and your agency over those actions. That means, you know, uh, agents basically psychology is how you win friends and influence people. Mm -hmm. So the point is, if you said now, okay, my goal, so you guys in this room said, okay, we've got whatever, 100,000 customers. Our goal is we're going to be 200,000 next year, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no point just saying that. And that's the problem with false... um, positivity is literally it doesn't work because you can hype up people but if you don't give them the tools or you don't have the tools you can't go anywhere so then you think okay how am i going to get there what is my actual plan what am i meeting is it more advertising is it us mm. getting more influence people whatever it is mm. you work that plan then between you the third thing is having agency over the plan so that you're totally comfortable with it and towards that you'll have to think You'll need to win more friends and influence more people. How do you do that, Mm. right? So then that gives you a blueprint for you going from here to there. And then if you don't get there, it doesn't matter because then you can say you understood the reasons. You also understand the reasons for why it didn't work. And then you can say, okay, now this is our new plan, right? But then you're positively working towards it as opposed to thinking, oh my God, you know, I haven't. I've had a lot of failures in life. So people... I don't think anyone who has succeeded hasn't failed, but in sometimes we almost have a um, toxic culture of um, success, right? Yeah. And I think it's like, I think even about happiness, right? It's almost like if you're not happy, because in the media you're constantly saying happiness, you've got to be happy. <laughs> people are telling you, like, and people are asking you, are you happy? Yeah. Well, like, if you're not, you're like, geez, I'm a failure because <laughs> I'm not happy. Everyone's saying I should be happy. 
But but what I think is, if you're positive and have this kind of uh, mind control, then you can actually think that it's okay to be happy uh, and it's okay to be sad at times. And I think that people confuse so the three types. So there's of course joy. So that's you know suddenly something happened to you which you or in your life you're joyful about, like a child or in a relationship, whatever. Then there's elation and that's the brief thing of suddenly you got something, you won an award or, you know, that kind of, right. But that's again temporary. And then the happiness is the overall continuum, right? But we try and thinking you've got to be all that. No, because there'll be things happen in life which may make you upset. Somebody you know may pass away, various things. And that's okay too. So, you know, but I think it's just that, that it shouldn't define all the rest we said is what makes you inside. If this is your only chance in life in this form, right, then do I want to spend my entire life just being with no, not taking control of it myself? And that's where I think the problem is, is we don't take enough control of the life. You Absolutely. have to feel in control. And sometimes if you don't have the tools to it, you actually don't feel in control. But the reality is no one is going to care about you if you don't care about yourself. Mm. Right. And, you know, like I think, you know, just looking at you now, I actually think you're looking fitter and better than <laughs> when I met you, I don't know, five years ago <laughs> or seven be. years ago. So, oh, gosh. So, so I reckon it's like that. So I think yeah. obviously it means that you have taken some steps towards having more positivity, hope, and, you know, that kind of stuff, yeah. which I'm really happy, you know. <laughs> um, I'm a, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, also – you know, there's things Guy and I have done. We came into a few customers, so we got ourselves medical insurance. Yep. I think those things represent, you know, positive things of investment into yourself, you know. So you know bigger things are so not covered, but you have other tools on your team now. We know we have a certain amount of coverage if one of us gets sick, you know, those type of things that I wouldn't have thought about. And I never thought about working for somebody. Even the positive stress of going out and trying to represent yourself under your business. It's a good positive stress. I say to kids when we're working on podcasts with them, it's a good stress you're feeling nervous about interviewing somebody because it means you're preparing yourself to try and do well. You know? That's right. And and I guess the the key thing in all this is that's why I often say make your work your fun and your fun your work right mm. so that's why if you're in a misaligned thing it doesn't work because it's hard for you to motivate yourself if fundamentally your heart isn't in it right mm. so if you are suddenly doing something just purely for the money then you tend to burn out and people just make money quickly and they get out of it and then they don't know what to do and yeah. and the reason is because life is a long journey and it's better to do things you are uh, um, fundamentally aligned with. And like I said, Sam, even with writing or anything else, you can't write somebody else's story, right? You need mm -hmm. to find your own voice. And like when I mentor writers, one of the reasons everyone wants to write a book, right? And everyone's like, oh, I've got the writer's block. I can't write. And that's because you're overthinking that you're already on the bookshelf and who's going to buy it, who's going to read it. So I'm a writer. I write more literary stuff. I write nonfiction as well, which is more help, help and that kind of stuff. But the reality is I'm not writing thrillers or romance. But of course, I know that those writers do phenomenally well and they're like the bigger superstars. Mm. But that's okay. That's not my path. So there's no point in me being envious of them or thinking, oh, I want to stay away and now start writing. That's uh, right. And that's what happens. That's how people often take businesses mm. on, right? Because you see something else which is sexy and like, I'm going to do that, right? But is that really you is what you got to ask yourself. Yeah. And what is funny. your life's purpose? Um, just on the writing too, because I didn't like writing, I also didn't like reading, but then came along audio books. Mm. Uh, I found a mentor at 41. I'm 43 now. And that mentor made me read a book or listen to a book called The Goal. And The Goal is written like a novel. And I wonder for writers to think about like and do that self-help in a storyline too. That could be a really interesting way. But again, you see, that depends on the reader, right? So a lot of mine are uh, exactly like that. So if you read The Genetics of Health, it's got lots of stories mm. and it's that kind of stuff. But lots of people don't like that approach as well. Some people just want, because they're used to reading the business yeah. books, they just want, <laughs> give me one, two, three, yeah. four, five points. Yeah. I don't want to read all the stories. <laughs> so it's funny, like, it's funny, my publishers often say, 
it's reading like a story. It's got too much of uh, like a storytelling kind of, so it's very literary. We need to distill it sometimes into points, yeah. right? So, so again, like I'm saying, so therefore my writing is probably more for people like you and others who like mm. the um, story form and, and nonfiction, but there may be people, and that's okay. And that's the thing is you don't have to feel that you have to cater to everyone. Absolutely. You don't have to feel that, oh, I'm going to miss those guys out because they're probably not going to read you anyway. Mm. Have so, you got audio books? Yeah, yeah. I okay. think that, uh, I mean, I haven't published any of them myself, but what mm. I mean is, but it's funny, like the next one I'm writing, I'm going to actually, uh, I've been talking to publishers of keeping audio book rights because mm. the funny thing is when it's with publishers in the past, they just get, um, I mean, interestingly now AI, they're trying to use your voice and stuff, but in the past they just give it to, uh, because say Simon Schuster published my book. So they've got somebody to read it. And I'd never listened to my own mm, book. Mm. And I was horrible when I read it. I was like, it hasn't got my energy. What I mean. Some old guy. Yeah. What I mean is it just didn't have that kind of energy, right? Mm. And so I'm thinking, well, if it's going to be not like what I wanted to be, then maybe I keep control and I, it, over time, just start reading it yeah, myself, no, right? Well, you, know, <laughs> so. you, you know me, you know this space, you can come here and record it. In the, you know, these are the same microphones that um, I think Thriller was recorded on. Okay. That's how they became yeah, popular. Yeah. And then Joe Rogan made them popular. So um, they could capture your voice. Uh, Sherrod, finally on the podcast, I have a weird, um, a bit of a weird tradition that I'm trying to bring in, which is um, part of the reason I started this podcast. It's in memory of my mum. So she died last year of cancer. And that was a journey, as it is. But I realized that the hope she gave me has helped me. Yeah. And her passing actually reminded me to go after some dreams, that it's time to do it now. And so her memory uh, is a good one for me. And I don't have any baggage of course, I miss her, yeah, but this helps me bring her up in a way where I can, you know, not have to um, turn into a blubbery mess. But I recorded some podcasts with her before she passed, and I thought it was so cool. But the one bit I never got her to say is, hey, I love you. I should have got her to say that. And I want to ask my guests if, if they can tell their family or their kids or someone they love that they love them out loud so we can record it. Yeah. Because I just think it would be nice to sit somewhere online in yeah. 50 years or 100 years if you don't crack the um, secret to longevity um, that your family can go back and listen to you and hear that you love them. Yeah, can you I, say I think that? absolutely. I think it's even more than just your immediate um, family. Mm. I think obviously, you know, my parents, my dad's got Alzheimer's now, so he probably, um, you know, wouldn't register a lot of it. But what I mean is even outside your family, your partner, your children. It's the friends who care about you, patients who respect you. I actually have a f fundamental um, gratitude of love. Like, you know, I just think by nature, like I'm loving being here. Uh, you know, uh, I love you for inviting me. <laughs> you know, the, I, I'm easy in uh, loving people in the sense, so yeah, so to everyone who gives us stuff about me or who follows what I do, who loves me, sending you a lots of love back. Right? Awesome. And, yeah. Cool. You know your kids are going to be like, say you love me, <laughs> say you love me. <laughs> but um, they know that. And, you know, that's why I think these little bits mean mean something. But anyway, um, thank you that's for okay. taking Pleasure. time for me over yeah. the years and – and uh, may our friendship continue in Absolutely. all of its different forms. And maybe we're AI one day and have still have these weird chats. But, uh, yeah, where can people follow you, Sherrod, if they want to follow your journey, um, pick up on any of the points you've talked about today? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, my website is simply just, they can just put com. If you want to follow my blog, it's actually called Skin in Your Game. And literally it, Instagram and, and TikTok and things. You just to add skin in your game. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, brother. That's all right. Thank you very much. <laughs> cool, man. This episode of A Beacon of Hope is proudly brought to you by Campfire Studios. Campfire Studios is an impact-led organization amplifying the voices of Māori and Pacifica communities via podcasting and video content. To find out more, visit campfirestudios.co.nz. Three, 
Thank you for tuning in to this frequency of hope in our podcast today. If you found value from this episode and want to hear more, I would love it if you could follow, subscribe and rate our show. By doing so, you will increase the frequency of the beacon of hope. So if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or any other platform, please take a moment to hit the follow or subscribe button and leave a rating and review. I truly appreciate your support and feedback and it helps us make our podcast even better. Thank you. Be good. Be safe. And be happy. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like that song, doesn't it? Be happy. All right, Mama, we stop there, eh? Yeah, okay. okay. All right.